the disciples, after Jesus' death and resurrection, went forth in power, standing up to all in front of them, boldly proclaiming that Jesus was alive. And you think that might sound a bit weird, but let's acknowledge what we do today might be just a bit weird, too. If someone asked you this at the end of the week and said, so, what are you doing this weekend? You'd say, well, on Saturday i got some cleaning to do. Then Sunday, you know what, I think I'm going to get together with some other people and sing about a dead Jewish dude. I mean, that, that does sound just a bit odd. Right? You, let's get together and sing about this Jewish peasant from 2,000 years ago. What empowers... Why does this make sense to us? Why do we do this? I mean, I think it's the same thing that empowers the early disciples. They did something that people would look at and say, that's a bit crazy. And they said, no, this is truth. This is power. This is the good news. This is the, the belief that the, this Jewish peasant is far more than a Jewish peasant. Right? Our ability to understand this, to have faith in this, faith being a gift of the Spirit, this is why we, we root our understanding of worship in this idea that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're not just singing about a, a Jewish peasant from 2,000 years ago. We're singing about the Lord, who is our Savior. And so we believe that as a gift of faith. I believe in the Holy Spirit. This is how the Apostles' Creed wraps up the third part of it. There's the starting point for who we are as Christian. What if, if you're going to follow Jesus, what do you want to know? Well, I believe in Father, I believe in the Son, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what empowers us as we worship. It makes, helps us convict us of, of its truth. It doesn't just say the Apostles' Creed that I believe in the Holy Spirit, though, because it has all those other things. It has the, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the, of the body, and the life everlasting. You ever wonder how those things got put there? It was it uh, two guys putting when they were putting it together back in Rome in the second century. Hey, Fred, we've got some things we got to put somewhere in the Creed. Well, do they fit in there under the Father or Son? Nope, but we got to put them somewhere. Where do you think we should shove them? Well, let's shove them at the end of the creed and see if anyone notices. That's a great idea. Let's do that, right? It's, like, it's the extra stuff. It's the epilogue. we got to say something about the church. Let's just shove it at the end and say amen and see if anyone notices. Is that what happened? No. No. What I think instead is that this is... Uh, all of these things tie into who, who the Holy Spirit is. We just need to take some time to explore that and explore these connections. Because I do think the Spirit has something important in the role of the church and the saints and forgiveness and the resurrection. We just got to take time to kind of tie it together. And I'm sure you've noticed how every time anyone ever preaches or presents, the last option is always the right option. One of these days I'm going to preach and give people four options, and it's going to be the second one that's right, just to mess with them. But today I'll go with the preaching convention. The last option, obviously they thought this through. I won't buck that trend today. Um, <clears throat> I believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Catholic Church. I believe in the church. I believe in the church not because it's perfect. It's not. But it is because it is the place where people have gathered for centuries to hear the stories of Jesus. You want to find Jesus? Go to church. That's where people gather. That's where people will tell the stories. That's where people live in the footsteps of Jesus. I believe in the church for it has changed the world and it has continued to be a place where the Holy Spirit moves and works. And not just I believe in the church, but I believe in the holy church. Right? It is the holiness of the Spirit that makes the holiness of the church possible. Again, not saying the church is perfect because holy has a sense more of being set aside. If something is holy, it's set aside for a specific purpose. Who here has a bread knife? Do you use it for anything other than bread? Nope. You use it for bread. You don't use it for vegetables. You don't use it for steak. You don't use it for anything else. You use it for bread. It is holy. It is set aside for that purpose. The church, in a very similar way, is holy. It is set aside for a very specific purpose. It is for the gathering of people to follow Jesus. To say the church is holy is not making any claim other than it is set aside. You put your bread knife for one task, you put the church for another task. The church, I think, is a bit more important than the bread knife, but I think you follow. Uh, and it's the holy Catholic church. 
Catholic as in universal. There's only one church because Jesus is one Lord and we are all bound together as we follow him and that is how it should be. And we tend to bicker between ourselves about who is following Jesus properly and this bickering is called denominations. And as far as I can tell, it is the denominations that profess the creed together that at least acknowledge each other. Right? We, need to, we, can, we acknowledge that Presbyterians and Lutherans and Anglicans and Catholics and all the other flavors of, of the church are also part of the same church. It's uh, unfortunate the, the parts of the church that do not profess the creed, those are the ones that tend to get kind of snitty about, we've got it right and you're wrong. Well, maybe. A little bit of grace between churches is usually a good idea. We all believe in the universal, the Catholic church, and I think that's a good thing. We also believe in the communion of saints. And this is another translation thing that we miss. There's a holy, holy, holy thing that's going on here. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the holiness of the Holy Spirit is what makes the holiness of the church possible. And then we're hearing about the saints. But the saints, the word is the same word. It's hagios. It means holy. It, it, so the saints of the church are the holy ones. So a holy spirit makes a holy church possible. And the holy church is filled with holy people. That's y'all. Right? You are called to be holy in the same way the church is called to be holy. And so it connects that back. We are holy because of the power of the Holy Spirit. In the communion of these saints, of the holy saints, there are people that are essential to us that we only know because of this community. Right? If you look around, are there people here that you would have never known if not for church? Yeah. And can you imagine your life without them? I know that I cannot myself. Right, we are called, this communion is called across all divisions, across all time. We are all bound together in this community, and we're all bound. Uh, the way that Hebrews lays this out, the book of Hebrews, is we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who run this race, having run it before us, and we are then running after them. We come to, to share together in this communion as a community. We, we, we pray, send your spirit on this bread that it may be for us the body of our Lord broken for us. Us. And that's a beautiful thing. So we then further say we believe in the forgiveness of sins. Have you ever had someone tell you that you are forgiven, they forgive you, and you're not sure if you believe it? Right? I forgive you. Are you just saying that? Or have you ever had that moment where you, you, you are forgiven, but you're not quite sure that you could be forgiven? We struggle to truly experience forgiveness, and it's a common struggle. Centuries ago at the founding of the Methodist Church, it's founded in many ways when John Wesley has a moment when he realizes that he truly is forgiven, and it sinks in in a way that has not sunk in before. We come to this table to communion, our community gathered in communion, and the way that we get to this table is that we pass the, we, we confess and then we pass the peace. And, and every time we pass the peace, it's this opportunity to practice peace, to open ourselves to the Spirit calling us together, to come to this table and to practice being forgiven. And that's a bold thing to do because if we're going to confess we are forgiven, that means we need to confess we're broken. And it takes a particular community to be able to be honest about yourselves, right? to be able to be honest about where you fail and how you fail, and, and even further, to be able to be a community where you can say, I'm not sure how I fail, but what do you see? The, the sins I'm always worried about are not the sins that I know about. I know that when I'm tired, I get kind of abrupt. And, and when I'm working pretty hard, I tend to ignore every, everyone else. I mean, I know my own tendencies, and, and they're, some of them are unfortunate. It's not those that I'm worried about. It's the sins that I don't know about that worry me. And to be a community gathered together where I can put myself in front of you and say, what do you see that I need to see? and then trust that we're still all going to be welcome at this table together. Because I believe that no matter what I put in front of you right now about me, you are still going to welcome me at this table. And the tr I hope that, that that's how we live our lives. We practice that together. And I think that's important in a world where we far too often reduce people to one noun. Think about the way we do that. The most common example is uh, if someone commits a crime, we call them a felon. Right? And we take an entire life and reduce it down to one word. And we do that often. What are the other words that we do that with? Right? If someone is a felon, if someone is 
What are the other words we use to sort of demean and simplify? Right? Hick. You ever hear that, hear that word? Hick, redneck. I mean, there are words we use to demean and simplify and diminish people. And, and here at this table, we accept everyone as a gift, everyone by a name. No matter what they have done, no matter how they are broken, at this table, you can be honest about who you are, and you are forgiven, and you are welcome here. You are known by, known by your name. And what it takes for us to do this is the power of the Holy Spirit, because we cannot forgive under our own power. It just doesn't work. Right? We need God's help to be able to forgive often. Right? So, we believe in the Holy Spirit, which calls out the Holy Church, full of the Holy Ones. The Holy Spirit binds us together as a church, makes it possible for us to forgive in this communion. This all holds together. It makes sense. That's how the Holy Spirit weaves into those things. It's, the, it's this last thing that kind of gets off the rails a bit. We're not sure exactly how it makes sense. What does the Holy Spirit have to do with the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting? Well, what's the connection there? Why does that make sense at all? Go back to how life begins. How does life begin? Genesis 2, we read that God takes dust, dirt, right? What does God do with that dust and dirt? He forms it. But if you have dust that's been formed, that's not life. What's, what's the next thing God does? God breathes into it. Another fun language fact for you today. Uh, the breath that God breathes, the word there is a ruach, that wonderful Hebrew guttural, ruach. Uh, and the Ruach, the breath of God, it's the same word that we find at the beginning of Genesis when we read about how God's spirit is blowing across the face of the deep. Same word. Wind, breath, same thing. And, and then we, talk, we read in, in, uh, at Pentecost how about, how, about how the spirit blows and blows the windows open and fills people with the spirit and they go forth to share this good news. Breath, wind, spirit. It's all the same word. Right? It's all the same. And so what life is, is God takes the stuff of creation and breathes into it the wind, the breath, God's spirit. And we breathe, and there's life. And I distinctly remember the first time I sat with someone who had died, and it wasn't an emotional tragedy for myself. It was, uh, it was in the hospital setting, and I was there, and the family had left, and I was sitting there with the, with the, 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 the body, the, and it took me a minute to realize what bothered me, what just got my attention. They weren't breathing. I, there was no motion. The one thing we never stop do is breathing. And to be next to somebody, and the breath, the wind, the spirit had left them, and they were still The resurrection of the body is when God takes the muck and the dust and the dirt again and fills it with the Spirit. That's what life is. Dust and dirt filled with God's Spirit. Resurrection is when the dust is filled with God's Spirit again and heads off into life everlasting. If, if, if death is when the Spirit leaves, life, everlasting life, is when we are so wrapped up in God that the Spirit never leaves again. Life everlasting is when this dust is filled with the wind and the breath of God in a way that is permanent. Believing the Holy Spirit, listening and allow it to guide us into faithful life, following in the footsteps of Jesus, gathered as the church in the communion of saints, that empowers us to forgive, giving us hope for tomorrow, you know, I don't think the third article of the Apostles' Creed is the dumping ground of everything that was important that they couldn't figure out how to, where to put anywhere else. I think the Creed captures what Jesus is getting at when he chats with his disciples near the end of the Gospel of John. This is his last, like, sit down and chat with the disciples before the, the crucifixion rushes up upon them. And Jesus tells his disciples that he will send a paraclete, a comforter, a guide. Parakaleo is the word there. And kaleo is uh, where we get the word Call. You can hear the CL there. The, the one who we call to us. And the one who we call to us will lead us into all truth. And the question is, do we listen? Are we listening here in the church with the saints at this table? I'm going to share with you a compliment I've received before and I don't deserve. 
because I need to give credit where credit is due. At times I have been told, Andy, you are preaching right to me. And I never have had the heart to tell someone when they've said that, sorry, I wasn't. Because if, if I get, sit down and start writing a sermon and I have someone in mind, you know what I'm writing? A lecture. Right? That's what I give my son when he does something stupid. I give him a lecture, a very short one. Right? I never write a sermon for a person. Because what a sermon is, a sermon is, is someone daring to get up and live out their faith in public. It's someone daring to get up and say, this is how I find God. This is what makes sense to me. This is my prayers. This is how I'm living, following in the footsteps of Jesus. And that's what I seek to do. I, get, I seek to get up and share with you, uh, this is where I, the Spirit is moving me. This is how I'm following Jesus. And so what happens when I share a bit about where I'm at is that prayerful words are heard by prayerful hearts. That, that's why it's so important that I kneel and stop and worship. I need to pray before every time I dare to worship because, and, and I hope you're praying this with me, God, help! Amen. All right? Every Sunday. That's about the extent of it. And uh, when prayerful words, prayerfully prepared words, meet a prayerfully opened heart, is it any surprise that you feel like something's been given to you? And it hasn't been given by me. It's been given by the Holy Spirit. It's been given by God. Not my doing. I can't take credit for that compliment. I would further suggest that your words to each other matter as well. It's not just the words of the preacher that can speak grace. They can speak uh, words of power. And, and when, you, you, when you tell someone that they're beautiful, you tell something that they are good, you tell someone that you are thankful for who they are, you tell someone it is a joy that you are here, you help me see the goodness of God. These are the words we can say. We can help people see, we can help people experience the goodness of, of the Spirit that guides us. Speak the words that you pray and speak the words of goodness and truth that you see in each other. Help people hear and see and name the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because it's there. We just have to have eyes to see. Amen.